Precision railroading, also sometimes called precision scheduled railroading or PSR, is an optimization concept popularized by railroading titan Hunter Harrison. Rather than rely on older practices like hub and spoke models, PSR practitioners operate on fixed schedules and emphasize point to point freight car movements, simplified routing, and fixed schedules. The result can be more profitable operations, less freight car inventory, and less manual labor. In this episode, special guests Dave Dealey, Gil Lamphier, and Mike Wiegand discuss PSR, how data and cybersecurity will play a big role in rail operations in the future, and where the locomotive industry is heading. Gil Lamphier has been known as the original financer of precision scheduled railroading. He's been on the board of directors and chairman of Illinois Central, CN, CSX, and Florida East Coast. Dave Dealey is a 32-year Class 1 rail operations veteran with both Union Pacific and BNSF, serving as BNSF's Vice President of Transportation for 14 years. Dealey has since consulted for six of the seven Class 1 carriers, as well as Ferromex and several in the short line industry. Mike Wiegand is a Shift 5 co-founder and currently its President and Chief Growth Officer. He's a former Army cyber officer, computer nerd, InfoSec and drone enthusiast turned an entrepreneur who loves all things control systems within heavy vehicles. Gil, Dave, Mike, welcome to the show. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm really excited uh, to talk with you two uh, and, and, and have Mike here uh, to help uh, talk about the, the future of the locomotive industry because you two have seen such a revolution over the past decades um, in how uh, locomotives operate at a fundamental level. So I think for a general audience, it would be a really great place to start just talking about traditionally, how have class one freight rail rate, railroads done business? Well, m- maybe I can start uh, after the uh, repeal of the Staggers Act. Uh, the uh, gentleman came into my office by the name of Ed Moyers, and he said uh, he was the vice president of the Peoria and Deacon Railroad, and that he'd never been promoted in his life uh, because he had these crazy ideas about how to run a railroad. And with that, he uh, had a 25-page handwritten in a no-cross-outs business plan for what became Precision Scheduled Railroading. Uh, We didn't have a name for it, uh, but he uh, acquired four short lines, combined them. Uh, 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 We later sold that. We invested $16 million. We sold it for $250 million. He later took the ideas to the Illinois Central. And it was at that time that he hired a young man who was a colleague of uh, Dave Dealey's from Burlington Northern, uh, Honor Harris, as vice president of transportation, who uh, had been uh, uh, shown to uh, sit in the corner of the room, facing the corner, uh, because he was using too much data, too much scheduling. And uh, Ed thought he knew something about railroading. And so he was brought on board And the important thing was that uh, there was the integration of uh, what's called silos, uh, but it was the integration of the thinking between the uh, mechanical, the transportation, the marketing, the engineering, the finance. They were all brought together to uh, keep everything in motion. It was a Toyota uh, lean manufacturing scheme of Southwest Airlines. Everything was going to be in balance. Uh, the right person was going to be in the right place at the right time. There was no redundancy and everything would flow. And that would create a low cost, balanced, uh, growing, uh, customer centric, on scheduled on time railroad for customers that had never been done before. And that was the objective. But what was critical to that was that the locomotives, which held together that reliability component, that those were functioning. And when and that was the first task that we took on at the Illinois Central, and when the team left to go uh, uh, do PSR over uh, on the West Coast, uh, on the uh, Southern Pacific, uh, Ed Moyers left, who was the CEO. He took one man, who was the chief mechanical officer, Henry Chigi. And the, the first thing they did was measure the output, the condition of the locomotives when they left the repair shop, because without knowing the condition of the locomotives, you couldn't have PSR. There were going to be breakdowns, on-plan breakdowns and failures. 
And that would be the death of any railroad system, let, let alone PSR. Yeah, it seems like such a logical way of running a railroad, right? Like be efficient with your resources, adhere to a schedule, you know, put reliability in for the customer. How were how were railroads doing business before PSR? What what did that look like? Well, you have to remember uh, railroads were God's gift uh, to the world, and they operated just the way they wanted to operate. And they are highly technical, highly engineered, highly dangerous uh, pieces. Anytime you're you're moving a ton of material for three cents a mile, or uh, moving a ton of material uh, 460 miles on one gallon of diesel, obviously something is going on in the background that allows those economies to be uh, uh, achieved. And as a consequence, these silos grew up. Uh, because things were highly technical, but they weren't integrated well. And these these had been in place for 140, 150 years before uh, the mid 80s when there was deregulation. And so you were changing something that went way back before the Civil War uh, in terms of the way people did things and the generations that grew up in those organizational schematics. Yeah, it, it, seems, so, it seems so simple. It seems so simple what I've just described to you, and and yet it's a complex operation and it's been in place for a long, long time. And and I guess along those lines, uh, Dave, you've spent over three decades, uh, you know, in, in in railroad operations. Can you give us a sense of uh, like you know, Gil used these terms, uh, mechanical and transportation, and you know, other maybe more familiar business terms. Can you give us a sense of how do big enterprises, uh, big rail operators, uh, how are they structured? What do these, these different silos look like? Well, the three main silos within uh, operations are transportation, uh, mechanical, and track, um, track engineering. And, uh, you know, I think as Gil alluded to, um, if you go back 30 years, um, one operations executive, say a general manager, handled all of the functions. And it was down to a division level, and it really actually came from the way the Civil War generals uh, set up their organizations. As technology started coming into play more and more, it was determined basically among most of the railroads that a silo uh, organization was probably better suited because of the fact that general managers were going to be challenged to manage all the different technological innovations coming in in terms of track maintenance and locomotive maintenance. As, as both of those uh, maintenance technique, techniques got uh, more and more complicated. So uh, just to build on that question and then just to, to add on to what Gil mentioned earlier, um, and you alluded to it, Josh, how did, you, how did railroads operate before precision schedule railroading and more importantly, why? Is that some of the better railroads, if you go back to some of the predecessor companies, um, and in, this was prior to Canada, or Illinois Central under Gill and Hunter's leadership, uh, uh, doing precision schedule railroading on that Chicago to New Orleans corridor. Uh, the, the old Southern Railway was noted as having a balanced network. And uh, I think one of the things from my, you know, interactions with Hunter and Ed, uh, Jim Foote and Ed Harris and Jim Venna and Keith Creel is you can take a look at uh, Burlington Northern implementation of what they call precision execution. And it was basically not sweating the asset. So I'm backing into the, to the subject. But I think the gentleman I just mentioned would say you, you sweat these assets. You sweat the locomotive. You sweat the freight car. You sweat the, 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 the yard, the terminal. And you sweat the critical points on the railroad where you know there's capacity constraints. And that's where the real payoff comes from, from a, a PSR perspective, is really managing those assets. And, it, and that, that really goes back to who's responsible for the assets. I think if you look at locomotives, some of the consulting studies that, that well, I knew this from my own experience, uh, running a 7,000 locomotive fleet at BNSF and then working with Union Pacific and Norfolk Southern on a locomotive asset utilization engagement, is eight or nine people, can, in eight or nine pieces of the organization can touch a locomotive. And therefore, with that many people touching it, it's tough to say who is really responsible for the maintenance, the utilization, of the locomotive. 
And from a sweating the asset perspective, you come back to say, how do I, how do I judge myself effective? And a lot of us have always come back to your, your active fleet in terms of numbers of units per gross ton mile. And then you want to equate that to revenue ton miles, obviously. But what are my units of productivity for that asset and how am I really effectively utilizing it? So anyway, uh, just circling back around, um, we've made the, we've made the uh, uh, organizations a little bit more complex from a silo perspective, which brings on challenges in terms of who spends for investing in an improvement versus who has to belly up to the bar and say the headcount or the, the supplies and parts come out of your, your separate budget. And so over the course of these economic cycles, and it's only been uh, uh, exacerbated in a quick cycle change because of the coronavirus impact on freight volume, is uh, a comment one of the chief operating officers made to me in, uh, in confidence, but I think he'd say it uh, publicly, is that anyone who tells you that they're currently not managing their locomotive fleet in a run to failure environment is lying to you. And then in turn, one of the chief uh, mechanical officers uh, who is responsible for a large locomotive fleet says, and, and I'll, I'll identify him maybe by, because he came from the, the major airline industry from a maintenance perspective. He said, in my estimation, the railroads have four times more data available to them than the airlines do, particularly on their on their jet engines or your power units. And you're utilizing what you have less uh, than what the airlines are. So it's not just about the data as, as it exists, as we're, we're very much aware at Shift 5, but also how you put that data into actionable data uh, and really drive it to um, a, an improvement in operating ratio and an improvement in on-time performance which would also uh, show itself in terms of asset utilization, in terms of car cycle trips per year or miles per day or uh, uh, an impact from an asset perspective. So as you improve asset utilization, you actually improve the service offering. Yeah, uh, Dave, that, that's a really illuminating look at like what happens internally to the organization and how you think we can solve some of these problems that we have PSR with, with more data. And so it, it strikes me as there's almost kind of three eras in, in how, how big um, locomotive uh, fleets get operated. You've got the old model of doing business, which as Gil said, is kind of like, hey, this is a complicated, you know, scientific uh, uh, area where we're trying to, in a very, very efficient way, move very large volumes of goods. And so specialization is really important, right? Because these concepts are pretty complicated. So we had a sort of siloed way of operating a railroad where uh, you, you don't really have a, a synchronized, um, uh, clear line of ownership over over locomotive assets and these sorts of things. We move into PSR where we start bringing kind of sensible operational management on top of things and optimizing the way that we're operating these assets. And then the next generation is to start incorporating more data in um, to solve some really critical problems with PSR, like, you know, the mechanical issues of running to failure. Um, so that's a really interesting arc. I'd love to take it also from the customer's perspective. So if you're a, if you're a customer to, to the rail industry, what was it like uh, to, to use um, freight locomotive um, services before PSR? Uh, and what is it like uh, today, Dave? Well, you know, after the, the growing pains, particularly is that we saw at CSX and its impact um, on a six month basis of it has to get worse before it can get better. Um, it, it, it adds very much to the predictability and reliability of deliveries um, and realizing that there's four or five major uh, groups, uh, commodity groups that railroads manage to. I think one of the things that we've learned from PSR is that uh, the railroads got siloed even from a commercial operations management. Uh, there was a grain group that kind of managed their grain fleet, an intermodal group that managed three or four levels within intermodal from premium all the way down to uh, international double stack, which runs on a, on a lower schedule. There's the automotive side of the business that's finished automotives going from origins to destination. Uh, there's the general merchandise group, which for a couple of railroads, it's largely made up of uh, chemical volume. Um, 
So, and then there's the coal side, which we all know what, what the impact of coal and uh, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that in terms of what it's meant from a volume perspective and how those fleets have been managed. So it really comes back to, from a customer perspective, it just depends on which one of those groups you're in, in terms of a uh, locomotive failure on a unit coal train, if you're running to uh, a tight stockpile supply, a uh, locomotive failure on a, a uh, one of seven grain trains going to Tacoma, Washington, that it, it takes seven trains to fill a ship. And you have a locomotive failure on any one of those trains, but particularly say for dramatic impact, the last one, and it delays a train 24 hours and you've delayed the, the last shipment for that, for that ship by 24 hours, the ship doesn't leave until then. And you're looking at another day of demurrage in the, in the harbor for the ship, as well as a lost day of asset utilization. Um, you can kind of look and see that uh, locomotive failure from a UPS perspective, United Parcel Service runs a very tight network, and uh, we benchmark them from a perspective of, uh, of, of really, from, from, from a UPS service, uh, surface package delivery network, you've got to have precision schedule because um, you pick up packages with your brown trucks during the day, they go through a sort process uh, to, to take the packages and get them onto some trans transportation A to B, which is generally the railroads are over the road, and then you have to break it down again at the other end. But bottom line is um, most of the sorting with the United Parcel Service is done at midnight. So all these UPS trains are really running from a long origin, say Chicago to uh, the Bay Area, or Chicago to LA or Chicago to New York to hit that midnight sort. The midnight sort lasts three hours. If you, if you miss that sort, you more than likely those packages are going to get delayed a day. So you're taking the tolerances of a couple hours and to say, if you're not here by 2 a.m., you might as well not show up until 2 p.m. and then I'll, I'll have it in place for tonight, but I'll have to spend overtime money or call extra people in because I'm going to have that volume plus the next day's volume to contend with. So, Josh, I'll stop there for a second just to say it's, it's not an easy answer uh, unless you take a look at the different commodity groups and what their service requirements are and how they judge failure or success within rail service. And, and maybe I could jump in and make it even in simpler and take it back a little bit further in time. Uh, I'll be, I recall when we took over the Illinois Central going up and down our line with the chairman and going to customers and we would go to the general managers of these large industrial plants. We would arrive and the general manager was used to trains pulling up uh, in front of his locations either three days early, uh, two days late and they'd pull up with the wrong cars and the wrong uh, quality of cars. So it would hurt, for example, the newsprint of the international paper plant. And he'd have 20 of our cars out back that he'd use for inventory uh, because he didn't know when we were showing up. And we asked him if, if we pulled up at his plant at three o'clock on Friday afternoons for 10 weeks in a row, would he give us a price increase? He said, if you guys do that, not only will I give you a price increase, I'll give you half my business because right now the trucks are killing me because I don't have a reliable option from the rails. And so we pull up every Friday right in front with the right cars, the right quality of cars for 10 weeks in a row. And sure enough, he gave us the price increase. He gave us the volume. And we did that 20 times up and down the line. And that's how we define precision scheduled railroading. We made the cars appear on time for when the customer wanted them. And then there came a point when we could ask for the 20 cars that we owned back from him because he didn't need them. And at the same time, we were repairing the locomotives so that instead of three locomotives with 40 cars behind them, we lengthened the cars out to 120 because we made sure from the mechanical standpoint that those locomotives function. They ran them with three locomotives because two of them were, might break down on the way. And once we fixed that problem, we could retire a lot of locomotives and we could uh, put the reliability element, the scheduled element back into PSR and back into railroading. And we've got to return that scheduled element 
if this industry is going to grow, we've got to put mechanical back as the foundation to PSR. We can't let things run to failure. That, that was never the intention. It's a temptation. Anytime your price earnings ratios go from seven times in the marketplace to 27 times, every dime becomes that much more valuable. But the system was never designed to run on dimes. It was designed to lower costs, provide reliable service, and grow and offer customers lower cost, more reliable service. And that's where we've got to get back to. And I think that's where Shift 5 fits in perfectly. Right. So Gil, if I, if I could just summarize really quick, you know, my layman's perspective on this, it sounds like before PSR, you know, the railroads were operating in a way that was uh, not congruent with, you know, this just in time kind of lean manufacturing, uh, you know, highly integrated, uh, you know, supply chain kind of processes that have now become the norm in the industry. And, uh, and, and PSR has allowed the railroads to use their assets, their uh, you know, much more efficiently, but that in turn adds significant pressure to make sure that reliability, uh, you know, uh, really is is done like it's never been done before because breakdowns now cause these dramatic system effects. You guys have given us multiple examples of that. Um, really uh, excited, I guess, to talk about the potential of how data uh, helps the railroads uh, get ahead of that and achieve and maintain and continue to, you know, incrementally improve all of these metrics. Um, If I heard you correctly, uh, you guys both touched on, you know, this need to compete with trucking. And, uh, you know, I think anybody that's looked at the transportation sector sees that autonomous vehicles are on the horizon. I mean, we we see, uh, you know, many uh, automation functions come into, you know, Tesla cars. Uh, I think the trucking industry is is well primed to be disrupted with, uh, uh, you know, some type of leader follower system in the near future. Uh, we've got uh, double 30, 33s, I think. I noticed those on the highway actually driving down uh, the uh, uh, the interstate the other day. And, and that was some recent legislation, I think, that's being passed to kind of open that up. So so trucking and automation are bringing pressure to the industry, if I understand that correctly. And uh, in, in, am I correct in, in saying that, you know, data really is the, the, the wave of the future and how the railroads are, are currently positioning their investments to... Um, you know, enhance PSR and uh, and to compete effectively? Well, maybe I should take a crack at, at uh, the notion of uh, the trucks. Uh, our highway system is not conducive to adding capacity by getting wider. And when autonomous trucks or extra large trucks begin to occupy that far right lane going at the speed limit, you're going to see other trucks and other cars move from that lane over. And so all the other lanes are gonna get congested. But because of the cost of highway expenses of adding lanes or or, uh, just repairing what we have now, you know, you're talking about amounts that are three to four times the cost per mile of of laying an extra uh, mile of, of rail or sidings. And so our congestion issue with autonomous trucks and those larger trucks is, is the congestion is just going to get worse and worse. And I think the big companies have figured this out. And this is where railroads have the opportunity because they have rights of way that don't have the width constraints. They can lay at three and a half uh, uh, million of an extra mile right down straight access from point to point. And uh, if we talk about the future of infrastructure in this country, it's it's going to be data driven that uh, allows for precise uh, delivery that is equal to trucks who are only going to get congested, particularly in outside the major metro and smaller metro areas. Yeah, and I mean. What's so interesting to me about the the need for consuming this data to live up to the promise of PSR is that, you know, Mike, as you've spent a whole career doing, oftentimes these assets, these OT assets have data already getting generated on these things that we're just, we're not collecting. It's just evaporating into the ether. You know, they're, 
they're they're talking, but no one's listening. Um, Mike, can you give us a sense of like in your experience having interacted with legacy locomotives that fit this specification? Uh, how hard or easy is it for you to get onto a locomotive, attach to all of these data sources, and then synthesize them for operators so that they can start getting towards the the smarter operations that we're talking about? Yeah, the great question. And um, I think first, a little bit of background insight. Uh, anybody that's looking at this industry for the first time, I think is actually quite surprised at the average age of locomotives. So, you know, locomotives, um, you know, can have a useful life of 20 to 30 years if properly maintained. And in many cases, they can be repowered where they essentially take them into a big shop, they overhaul them, they replace the prime mover, you know, the massive uh, diesel generator that creates all the electricity that goes to the traction motors. Um, and, uh, you know, incremental improvements, um, you know, really have been kind of a way of life uh, to extending the service life and, and breathing uh, new, you know, tricks, if you will, into uh, many of these old dogs. The main line locomotives, which do most of, you know, the the heavy long distance, uh, you know, hauling uh, for the for the rails, um, you know, they uh, they've been around for at least a decade. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the average age for, uh, you know, some of these uh, uh, class one freight railroads is, you know, 22 to 26 years for their locomotives. So, um, you know, they've been very smart about adding new electronic components uh, in order to gain efficiencies and address various problems. But like we see with any complex, you know, large transportation system that relies on, uh, you know, multiple subsystems under the hood to affect a, a, a complex operation, like uh, moving as much goods, uh, weight, you know, at the distance and efficiency that, that is required, as, as you guys described, um, it, it, there are there are challenges in integrating uh, you know these new electronic systems to one another. So newer locomotives that are coming out from OEMs that have a, a high degree of vertical integration, where the OEM owns or has purchased a lot of companies that build the individual subsystems that kind of uh, you know comprise all of the organs uh, you know within the uh, the systems. Uh, they're in a position to uh, better integrate that data. Um, but the vast majority of the locomotives that are out in the fleet and and will be used for the you know coming decades are in many cases uh, you know a, a hodgepodge or or a collection of varied subsystems coming from different OEMs, and I think that this diversity actually provides advantages to railroads because it puts them in a position to kind of compete different engine manufacturers, different control systems companies, uh, in order to advantage the railroad to pick and choose the best technology keep innovation, competition, um, you know, uh, serving the industry and ultimately the customer benefits. Um, but what we see is that there hasn't been a high degree of integration of the data. And, and this is a common story that we've seen in other industries that have kind of evolved in a similar path. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, today when a mechanic needs to, you know, do some thorough diagnosis on a locomotive, Often he needs to gain physical access. He physically has to go to the locomotive, carry with him a laptop with multiple software packages from different vendors and a backpack full of cables so that he can plug into the various different line replaceable units or electronic computers that are on board. He'll need one solution in order to pull data off of the crash hard data recorder. Um, many of these now are being upgraded with you know some, some remote data dump capability, but uh, that that solution and that software package and that vendor's capability is not going to talk to the to the main train control unit. Is not going to talk to, uh, you know, directly to be able to diagnose and pull fault codes and do real time data acquisition at the granular level and capture 100 percent of the data availability from the engine control units, the computers that are controlling the prime movers, or in a freight instance, the head end power generators, which is a second en uh, engine that produces all of the electricity for. Uh, the uh, the rail cars that that are carrying passengers and of course you know without that uh, you don't open and close doors you don't have air conditioning or heating or lighting these are these are important subsystems and and uh, these locomotives are only getting smarter because um, you know as we've seen in every industry the the march toward automation uh, yields significant returns and and generally increases reliability and, and decreases the overall capital expense um, of the uh, of the asset, you know, distributed across its, uh, its yeah. useful lifetime. So, so I mean, uh, yeah, you, those are the challenges. Yeah, and 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 this isn't theoretical. I mean, you've you've done this on on locomotives. Um, I mean, 
one thing that you you mentioned, which is which is fairly clear, is that you know you no longer have to have somebody with a with a backpack full of cables and a laptop loaded with with proprietary software to to go and and plug into various subsystems and this like manual tedious error prone process. Um, so you can automate you know real time fault codes and that sort of thing. But what other opportunities are there in this data uh, that you've that you've seen that that can help operators be more efficient and, and safer? Yeah. So in my first sponsored experiences to get on board locomotives and install a data acquisition system that would tap into everything in a way that hadn't been done before. Uh, you know, originally we were doing that for cybersecurity sake, right? You know, Shift Five's kind of bread and butter, but very quickly and primarily because of the economic pressures that coronavirus has been placing on uh, our, you know, the, the railroad uh, uh, clients that were giving us this opportunity, we saw a need, a requirement really to help operationalize this data. And there we started to experience the, uh, the challenges, uh, but also the opportunities that this data presents across multiple business units. Um, what we've what we've learned just at a very high level is that when you can capture all of the data from all of the subsystems, one, you advantage your ability to do real-time status and health monitoring of the system of systems, right? So now you're not just looking at uh, reports from the engine manufacturer through their telematics offering. You can correlate engine health with traction motor performance and then show how that is uh, being affected by the locomotive's uh, environmental uh, conditions that it's being operated in, you know, the outside temperature, the grade of the track that it's on, because now you can mix in geolocation um, and, and show how maybe operator handling characteristics, how the operator is applying the, uh, you know, the main train and dynamic brakes or how they are, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, slamming in some cases, you know, the throttle lever, uh, you know, from like zero to eight, you know, doesn't, doesn't uh, do great things sometimes for, for the performance of these locomotives. You can, you can start to see and capture a holistic view. So the operations and maintenance are, are clearly advantaged there. But what's really exciting, Josh, is that we found uh, some really cool use cases for this data in other areas of the railroad, uh, like corporate enterprise that we were surprised by. I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, California recently has been pushing some very aggressive, uh, uh, emissions control measures that um, are going to uh, place some new data requirements needs on all of the rail operators that are operating within the state. And uh, you know, if if something gets adopted nationally, um, you know, this this may become a requirement that everybody has to uh, address. And so they were looking for a way to be able to measure, um, you know, these railroad operators in the state to be able to measure in real time many of the emissions. Uh, metrics coming out of their exhaust stack uh, so that they could uh, use this to kind of showcase uh, where they are, you know, establish a baseline or metric, show that additional investments being made into, you know, potentially alternative uh, low exhaust fuels or after exhaust treatment systems, you know, could get them some kind of credits uh, from a tax perspective or, or other, uh, um, you know, other breaks. Uh, that that was really interesting kind of use case that uh, we found that you know there was already data um, on these locomotives that uh, that we just needed to kind of capture, unlock, and then provide to the customer. Um, and then by adding a couple very inexpensive sensors out of the automotive industry, that you could kind of cover the gap without having to buy a, a super expensive you know solution from the OEM um, that then you know kind of vendors vendor locks you, and, and that isn't uh, an attractive option for a railroad that might be operating with a diversified fleet from multiple OEMs. And then within each, each locomotive OEM kind of, uh, you know, fleet that they have, they might have a, a combination of repowered locomotives. So there'll be an incredible diversity of engines actually operating under the skin of, of, you know, one particular locomotive model. It's a, it's a interesting challenge. So you know, that's just one example of an additional business area that we found, hey, here's some data that allows them to make better business decisions and potentially help them save money. Um, we're currently working with some of our clients right now to show how data that we're collecting off these locomotives can help on a compliance perspective, can help them save money on insurance, can uh, help them directly impact uh, uh, safety, uh, not just by securing the onboard systems, which is where we started, but also looking at how they could use this to augment other systems that have been in place for a while and, and drive safety in a pretty exciting uh, direction. I have to be a little vague there because uh, we're, we're still pretty early with that uh, concept. But um, 
I, I think that the point is that railroads are incredibly sophisticated organizations. They are um, by necessity uh, technologically, uh, you know, they, they are experts in their systems and they see the value that this data can provide. But the industry um, as a whole has kind of been, been uh, held back from realizing the full potential of this because the railroads often do not have direct uh, comprehensive access and ownership of the data on their own assets. And so that's, uh, you know, obviously a, a challenge that's directly in line with um, uh, with my personal career mission and, and with what we do here at Chef. I'm really excited to contribute to that. May I just ask one thing, uh, uh, Josh, sorry, but, you know, what's amazing to me is, to listen to Mike talk about this is how you can take off-label, highly sophisticated, military-grade, anti-cyber equipment and take it and in three, three and a half hours, hook it up onto a, a locomotive or one of these other applications and uh, within a, a couple months actually be displaying to a user exactly how this will look and be able to say from a proof of concept, hey, this is it. Can you use it? Which we obviously think you can. We think it's better than anything else or no. But how do you so easily make that shift from something that's so over here to something over here? Well, it it, it strikes me almost as a, a sim, similar analogy to like the PSR shift, right? Like you're you're doing things one way. You bring a sort of sensible approach to, hey, we're going to refine the way we're doing business and we're going to be deliberate about it. And and you can really have fundamental impacts. And and ultimately, the the convincing argument is ROI, right? It's return on your investment and, and, uh, and, and cost savings. So, you know, one of the things that struck me when Mike was discussing all of the ways that unlocking this data that's already there... Uh, can help railroad operators to to be more efficient, effective, and safe. Is that it? Also, maybe is a way of closing one of the the key uh, weaknesses or or the Achilles heel of PSR, right? Um, so you're talking about, hey, it's great. You're going to squeeze a lot more efficiency out of these locomotives by running things on schedule and being very deliberate about where you're utilizing resources. But like Dave was saying, if there's a variance in the uh, a high variance in the in the uh, usability of the of the locomotives uh, and and they're they're unreliable, PSR kind of breaks down, right? You you're you're you you're undermining the entire purpose of of why you do it in the first place. So, Gil, how do you think about the opportunity? Uh, for PSR of bringing like mechanical, this idea of all of the data that 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 Mike's talking about uh, on the mechanical health of a fleet, bringing that back into PSR. How, how do you think about that and 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 the ROI? I think there's six actual uh, buckets. I think there is uh, on the straight cost side. Um, there is the uh, since you know the condition of the locomotive when it's coming in you're able to schedule better, which is going to reduce your overtime. Uh, you're going to be able to uh, direct the workforce directly so that his her productivity on the mechanical side is going to go up. Uh, the availability index, which is the percentage of locomotives that are available for mainline use, which is somewhere in the 93% area, if that only went up by a couple, one or two, uh, points that would be enormous, uh, and I think most importantly, the quality of what you were discharging from that repair unit when that locomotive goes back on that is what Dave is getting at because ensuring that you don't have the unplanned failures in a PSR system that is either a dense system or it has only a couple tracks that can lead to backups and recruiting charges and the tremendous expenses there. It's almost the first three I can quantify for you, and if they run into the billions of dollars of market value for an individual uh, rail. That next one, uh, it, it can be done. It's very complex. But the last one is really the one which uh, I'm excited about. 
which is I think this reliability index, uh, uh, reliability for uh, the railroad allows them to go market themselves back to customers on a new basis. I think their ability to show up on time, to originate on time, to arrive on time, to do so consistently, to do so uh, and be able to, to go after new segments in the merchandise areas, uh, to partner with trucks. Uh, I think you are opening up uh, the, the next avenue of growth. If the last 15 or 20 years has been on the expense side, I think the next 15 or 20 years is going to be on the growth side and using that tremendous expense advantage and the cash flow to getting the railroads back into a growth mode. That makes a lot of sense. And it's it's almost like you you can address some of the expense side by potentially not running these things to failure and fixing, you know, doing a more preventive maintenance based uh uh, approach to keeping these things running, uh, but also that it, it improves reliability, ultimately customer experience and, and, and your top line, um, a kind of all in one, one fell swoop. Um, Dave, you know, you've, you've operated, uh, lo locomotives for, for decades. I mean, what is the importance of being able to measure these repair times when they come into the shop? Well, it's well, stating the obvious. It's 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 very important to one predict uh, what work needs to be done on that locomotive, what uh, people need to be set up. Uh, within the, the union crafts, there's three or four different union crafts that need to be prepped, whether it's electrician, pipe fitters. Uh, predicting what the man hours are going to be applied, and then also having obviously the spare parts, uh, you know, ready to go. And then taking the best opportunity, identifying the best opportunity, the best shop, uh, the best time in that cycle of the predictive cycle to say it fits better for the for the locomotive to to go here now versus wait two days and go to a different shop. I think one of the things that we bring to the market is, you know, one of the first uh, to enter the market a, couple, a decade and a half ago was the GE Health Monitoring System. It was a product. And I think what we're offering without trying to play on words is a solution because I'll give you one myopic example and then a macro example. Uh, Alliance Nebraska was where BNSF really headquartered its locomotive fleet. And we had maintenance agreements with GE, EMD, Amstead, uh, Progress Rail, and then we had our own people that maintain our own set of, of SD40-2s. And so you had this one huge, uh, massive humanity in this locomotive shop, and you had four or five different providers. So it added, adds really to the complexity. The other thing about the complexity, and this goes back to, again, being a solutions company versus a product company, um, and I think we're both actually, is GE's contract was written to, to be a 93% availability. Okay, so what's wrong with that? Well, railroads tend to get bigger clumps of business three or four months out of the year versus others. And so from a, a, a solutions perspective versus a product perspective, my point always was either from the transportation or customer side, why can't we say that I'll take 90% in the slack months, but I got to have 95% or else I have to size my fleet for the, for the Easter Sunday impact of the March, April, and then the August, September, October versus somebody who's flexible enough to have not a one size fits all approach but a reactive, uh, very reactive uh, into the predictability side of saying I can ramp up or ramp down and offer a cost-effective solution. So I, I don't know if I made my point as well as I wanted to there, but uh, you know we're, we're entering a market where we could be a, an across the board provider of not only cybersecurity, but, but maintenance predictability. And up until date, um, well, I was gonna go to the macro, so we do some film editing there. But if you take a look across the seven class ones in, in terms of uh, railroads that have wanted to maintain their own, own locomotives with their own people versus railroads that have basically wholesaled it out to, to GE or the, uh, the current version of GE Wabtec, uh, you know, you, a one size fits all approach to the seven class ones isn't gonna work unless you can be um, uh, customizable to their situation and their agreement on how we convert this into real value uh, from an ROI perspective. 
Yeah, absolutely. And David, it makes so much sense that like being able to predict in the future is going to make all of the model based decisions and the precision and precision scheduling railroad, uh, precision scheduled railroading. Um, that's going to be the arbiter of how effective it is. Right. And, uh, you know, Mike, you talked a little bit about how there are all these subsystems on locomotives that are already generating loads of data that um, there's a richness to them that we can extract um, core insights out of to do prediction, the kind of prediction that Dave is talking about. Um, there's also an opportunity to integrate other sensors potentially in a smart way. I think you, you talked a little bit about this when we were getting into some of the emission standards uh, in, in you know California recently passed and being able to do smart experimentation. Um, but what are some of the other ways that you're thinking about potentially integrating uh, traditional kinds of analysis, but doing it uh, in a real time way with 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 integrated uh, data streams that are already existing on the locomotive? Yeah, great question. So, uh, a couple concepts. We think that edge computing really um, enables uh, a whole host of kind of new sensing and uh, and problem solving for railroads. So uh, as I mentioned, there's a ton of data being generated on these locomotives, but bandwidth is typically uh, a challenge because uh, you know many of the freight operators, they operate in some really extreme environmental conditions. And so they may be operating in parts of the country where there are not high bandwidth uh, you know, infrastructure data links in order to uh, you know, pull back 100% of everything that's being recorded on the locomotive, you know, on, on, uh, on a locomotive. Um, we've taken a, a pretty interesting, um, and, and hard look at how to solve that and be able to shovel back as much as possible, but also provide the flexibility so that a railroad, um, you know, can rapidly develop their own models or pay a third party to uh, write different algorithms and then host those and kind of a snap in capability on the assets live. And, and we haven't uh, bucketed that to like a particular set of uh, value propositions because we think that that uh, is useful for everything from cybersecurity, safety, compliance, uh, you know, locomotive status, health, and predictive modeling. Um, with the advances that have been made in microelectrical, uh, uh, yeah, so microelectrical mechanical systems, MEMS technology, you know, and everything that's uh, come along in the cell phone industry over the last couple of years, uh, we think that there's an opportunity to instrument more locomotives with uh, really high fidelity. Um, accelerometers and uh, and other sensors that could expand the number of uh, sensors in a locomotive, you know, in a railroad's fleet that are doing things like uh, uh, track analysis, um, that are doing things like sensing, uh, you know, at the head and at the tail of a, of a constant uh, car performance and, and then provide that data to other systems that are already in place, you know, the undercarriage camera systems and the hot axle um, you know, uh, uh, detection systems uh, that uh, that are typically positioned at you know major uh, you know choke points and, and thoroughfares. Uh, we think that there's just a, an enormous opportunity to um, add inexpensive sensors to solve unique problems, uh, but then do real time you know computing on the edge on the locomotives in order to solve some of the uh, the bandwidth problems, which poses you know pretty significant capital and infrastructure challenges. Uh, when you're operating, you know, transcontinental uh, or, you know, across an entire continent, you know, from coast to coast to coast, in some cases, uh, you know, there, there are railroads uh, that uh, in the in North America where it's not uncommon for, uh, you know, a car to be on the East Coast, on the West Coast, and then down into the Gulf of Mexico over, you know, a, you know, a couple month period of time. So that's, that's kind of where uh, we're trying to identify uh, opportunities in the future and position um, the conversations that we're having with customers and the technology that we're developing to uh, to be modular and flexible so that as we gain better appreciation working with clients as to what the specific problems are that they need uh, you know solved that uh, quickly we can innovate solutions with them and show how uh, you know you, you, we can essentially provide a platform that allows them to experiment um, quickly identify what works and doesn't work and and gain, uh, you know, the, the necessary uh, solutions to these problems that they're seeking. Um, it's it's so broad, though, it's difficult to really put your finger on it because there is so much potential, I think, uh, to reduce the cost and to leverage data and edge computing to, uh, to solve a number of issues. 
Yeah. And I mean, I think we've been talking a lot about optimization uh, issues, but there's also um, a lot of uh, opportunities on the safety front. You know, one of the biggest innovations to hit railroading in the past decade is uh, positive train control, right? PTC. Uh, and I know, Gil, you've been tracking this for, for a long time. Could you tell us a little bit about what PTC is, uh, you know, why it came about? And um, I mean, we, we hit a real milestone uh, at the end of last year. So um, give us a sense of, of what the trajectory of PTC has been. Well, PTC came about in a, a very short order uh, when there was a collision in L.A. on Metrolinx uh, when a conductor was uh, playing with a Nintendo game and crashed into the back of a parked passenger uh, uh, set of uh, cars. And uh, there were several deaths. Uh, John Fenton was brought in, who's now head of Patriot Rail. Uh, and that has since gone to some of the safest uh, uh, railroading in the country. Uh, but within a matter of weeks, Senator Schumer had passed a bill which would prevent that type of rear ending or head-on collisions, uh, or railroads uh, going into a curve uh, on uh, too fast of a basis. So if the operators didn't notice this from their signaling, uh, it would automatically slow everything down. And in the stroke of a pen, suddenly a $20 billion expense burden was put onto the railroads who originally thought they'd passed on to their customers. Well, that didn't happen. And so, uh, no one realized the technical difficulties uh, because the only technology that existed was a very small startup company with a, a very infant uh, technology that would be able to do this. And it took six or seven years uh, and deadline after deadline that was uh, missed and then extended. And then everybody had done their own PTC system. And so they then had to all be integrated. Uh, so I think we're finally working that now. Uh, there's some who feel that it was a tremendous use of money with limited benefit. And now everybody is looking for how do you benefit from this communication system? Uh, but as I reviewed it, unfortunately, the interaction between PTC and the locomotive, uh, which is the key uh uh, interface leaves itself open to cyber uh, attacks uh, from malintended people. Yeah, I mean, because this system by its nature is interconnected with uh, with all the wayside infrastructure, right? Um, Dave, can you uh, talk to us a little bit about, uh, in a practical perspective, like how have uh, railroads integrated PTC over the past decade or so? What is it? What does it look like? Just nuts and bolts uh, as they're starting to integrate this stuff onto the wayside infrastructure and the, and the rolling stock. Well, I'd say on a scale of one to ten, um, with regard to the cost benefit analysis of PTC versus PTS, which was positive train stop versus positive train control. Um, if you looked at the industry as a whole, uh, which is dangerous because the standard deviation is a little too high, um, but uh, I'd say they're on a two. Uh, they're on a two out of a scale of ten in terms of really getting the value. Yes, uh, head-on collisions have been prevented, overspeed uh, derailments have been prevented, but the actual asset utilization um, and, and as it pertains to locomotive availability and utilization are still yet to be realized. So, yeah, short answer, there's still a long way to go in terms of really cashing the check on the 15 to $17 billion uh, investment. Yeah. And I mean, it's a tremendous amount of money, but it's created, I think, like an infrastructure that, Mike, rem rely reminds us a lot of the sorts of sus subsystems that uh, that we're tapping on to, to unlock data from, you know. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about number one, uh, some of the opportunities that PTC gives us to like do other things that uh, can can be a, a return on investment for for railroads, but also maybe some of the concerns based on her cybersecurity background that we have in now um, interconnecting these trains in such a fundamental way with a 
with a with a wireless, um, you know, remote distributed uh, infrastructure. One of the biggest benefits is the timeliness of data, and then secondly, our ability to uh, from developing algorithms to basically put into an exception management versus just data management. So, you know, we can talk a lot about scorecards, but it really is helpful that we understand. Uh, when a particular element is getting close to a red line event uh, and, and being able to send an exception alert versus just count on people to check a dashboard every, every eight to 10 hours. And that it does go back to the timeliness of data being more real time or predictive versus uh, waiting to go by a wayside detector that's every 300 miles and, um, you know, waiting for a download to, to occur. Uh, you know, there's, there's, Still, a lot of potential to, from an asset utilization perspective, not only in locomotives, but in critical choke, choke points on the railroad, uh, terminals that can tend to be at a choke point certain days of the week or certain times of the day or certain times of the year, that anytime you can get um, out ahead two to three days from a predictability standpoint, there's a lot more solutions than waiting until this particular shift. Uh, railroads tend to still operate in eight hour increments. Um, it's just because union shifts run eight hours and 85% of all railroad employees are union based. So uh, the time horizon really comes from the use, the, the effective use of data into more of a 72 or even a five day outlook to be able to uh, solve problems before they happen. I know that sounds like a, a, a vague term, but you know, how, how you make critical decisions with, with, far out enough in advance with enough variables that you can make the right decision versus waiting till it's right on you and your choices are greatly reduced. Yeah, Mike, I mean, what kind of safety concerns do you have about PTC? First, I, I want to say, you know, I think some of our nation's best minds went into designing uh, most of the common PTC systems that we see deployed. Um, they are by and large, uh, you know, at this point, having uh, been deployed and operationally tested for several years, uh, fairly reliable. Um, and I, I think that there is increased opportunity to uh, provide returns to railroads by using PTC to either increase safety or um, or potentially use it uh, to affect some of these operation and maintenance concerns that, that we've talked about. Um, anytime that we're adding new electronics to a locomotive that has any ability to affect any of the physical systems or is being integrated with subsystems that um, that subsequently control physical system, you know, there is some concern. And uh, we want to see as a best practice, uh, you know, things like uh, data encrypted at rest, full data encryption, inter- you know, including on internal networks on, on locomotives, trusted platform modules, uh, you know, uh, uh, update systems, configuration management, configuration control, um, you know, hardened uh, uh, operating system platforms that are are being uh, you know routinely inspected and patched, um, and and these are things that I, I think as an industry we're we're generally just not uh, doing across um, both onboard PTC subsystems or across the other subcomponents onboard the locomotive. So that's that's an area uh, you know clearly that we can use to improve. But it, it strikes me that you know such. Uh, incredible investment was made to buy 220 megahertz um, bandwidth uh, accesses across the nation, uh, that there may be an opportunity to leverage uh, some of that bandwidth um, on a lower priority basis uh, to push as a primary or alternate communications path, you know, a lot of the status and health uh, tracking data that that could be useful and help, you know, recoup or recover some of the costs there. Um, I was recently informed in a conversation with, uh, with the rail uh, industry veteran that you know many fatalities um, and and injuries occur actually every year in the rail yards as the brakemen uh, and women that are you know coupling and decoupling trains and they're you know riding cars at the end of a uh, of a consist as they're stacking and reconfiguring uh, you know cars before uh, departing a, a yard or a terminal um, that uh, you know m- many of these people get injured every year it really kind of speaks to the fact that there's a you know, a lot of uh, really powerful uh, kinetic uh, and potential energy forces at play. And uh, sometimes those can be a little bit hard to predict when you have uh, the kinds of distances. Uh, I, I was, uh, you know, taken aback the first time that I saw how a train can really stretch and jump. 
um, you know, and how these uh, force shock waves can traverse, you know, an entire consist. And I know that none of this is new to, uh, you know, to industry veterans listening, but uh, to, to those that haven't uh, spent any time around trains in a rail yard, they really, truly are uh, pretty dangerous. Um, and, and so this industry insider told me that, you know, that that's actually where a lot of people uh, get injured every year is in these yards. And, uh, and by and large, there's, there's no such thing as like a backup camera um, or a forward looking camera that can be remotely monitored um, by somebody on, on the, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a control tower or a yard master. Um, and that uh, we haven't really fully implemented or taken advantage of the ability to use machine learning algorithms for the trains to be looking through these cameras and, and identify if somebody is on the tracks and maybe has their back turned, isn't paying attention and, uh, and, and use some automation or technology to potentially, you know, decrease the, the number of injuries uh, in some of these situations. So I think that there's, there's two opportunities there, you know, ML cameras, um, you know, some automated monitoring and, and safety interlocks. And then the second is, uh, you know, within the, within the yards, um, you know, live streaming that data to the appropriate people that maybe could have, uh, you know, uh, iPads or, or some type of tablet um, and, and use that as a, as a way to increase safety when they are remotely controlling uh, some of the yard switching locomotives, um, since they often have a better advantage from a tower or something and, and can, uh, you know, push things around, you know, with, with better, uh, you know, bird's eye view. So I, I think that those are two really interesting safety implications that, uh, I hope we get the opportunity to to look at and maybe develop as as we figure out what our uh, product you know critical path looks like over time. But I would love to hear from industry uh, you know representatives if if that is uh, you know an investment or a conversation worth having. I, I truly want to run that one to ground. We had that conversation, Michael, actually about fifteen years ago. In terms of and and the reason we didn't pursue it was we it's surprisingly enough. We didn't think our vendors at the time, because we were dealing with a short set of railroad vendors, could could design something battle hardened to deal with with weather and and a high degree of reliability. I mean, uh, just take Barstow, California, as a big hump yard. A lot of trains go through there a day. Um, a lot of activity goes on. It's a switching environment. Um, but we were looking at even flip downs. Of uh, we already have cameras uh, that are pan, zo- pan zoom, high quality surveillance cameras. But we never really. Uh, you had to be at a console. You had to be at, at a uh, well at a console to be able to watch it. And what we were always looking for is how could I get a flip down set of goggles or a one an ocular that could come down and basically give me that v- that visual screen. So that as I'm operating my belt pack and I'm making a shove of 60 cars to a joint where I'd normally need a person there to identify it, and that's the person you're describing is probably the most in harm's way, is how do I eliminate the the need for that guy? And I could do it with this camera, but yet I want to be out in the field and I don't want to have to go to a kiosk or have to or have to carry around a a uh, uh, an iPad, because if I carry around an iPad, then I can't jump on and off a freight car or throw a switch or do some of the things that I need to do. But taking that technology to that level, but also from a, it's not AI, it's 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 similar risk identification, but being able to use that camera and see a human being put themselves in harm way, and then, and then come into an all stop or at least a warning uh, uh, situation, uh, and how to make that vital. Uh, in a railroad operation, not an add-on, but but how to make it vital. So I, I'm very excited about what you're talking about, and I think its applications are huge. Dave, we need to talk more about this offline, but um, it, I mean, it just strikes me that I think that the technology is there because uh, Barstow, in particular, brings me back to my military days. That's where we would uh, railhead all of our equipment to uh, Fort Irwin, the National Training Center. I had a uh, I had some personal experience, uh, you know, watching our equipment. Um, uh, you know, get uploaded and downloaded at that particular yard. So I actually know that one quite well. But what you're describing, I I, I believe firmly that the technology is there, that we have the, uh, you know, the hardware and the software capability that can live up to the, uh, the, the environmentals and the ruggedization requirements, and that can meet the human factors engineering uh, issues and requirements that you just described, you know, allowing people to have their hands free. Uh, I mean, these are problems that, uh, you know, I, I, I just, it strikes me that the railroads operate in similar environmental conditions to a lot of the military 
environments that I've operated in, developed hardware and software solutions in both in and out of service. And so if we can be successful there and then uh, you know, use unit economics in order to drive this to a solution that's really affordable and can be integrated, I can't see why we can't do that uh, in the rail industry. So I'm I'm uh, I'm taking a note now so that we can circle up on that and, and talk a little more because I think the time's now. I mean, it's it's 2021. We have the technology. Well, I mean, uh, with PSR has driven a, uh, a change in terms of how railroad yards are operated. And from a hump yard perspective, either you're running full out or you're not running at all. You've, you've been uh, devalued to a flat switching yard. And flat switching always adds a little more sa- a higher uh, risk of safety component because it's it's not... It's not a, an automated Henry Ford type of an environment. It's a little bit different every minute, every hour in terms of what you're doing and how you're, you're, you're swinging blocks and switching cars manually versus in a more manufacturing environment of a hump yard. So uh, I see that opportunity even greater now than it was. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like there are so many opportunities for us to be smarter and safer by integrating sensible modern technology onto these things. Um, Gil, you know, you've seen a very long trajectory of going from a really old style of running railroads that hadn't changed much since, you know, the 1800s through like a real revolution over the past 40 years. What what do you think the new industry standard looks like five years from now? I I think cooperation. uh, Collaboration. uh, Collegiality. See, typically railroads um, wanted things for themselves. And I think in this new age that we're in, uh, that uh, sharing is going to be defined as having uh, a two, two times two is going to equal eight. Um, and once you begin sharing, because railroading is a shared system. So what I see is that you're going to, the railroads are going to realize that there, there's no reason to have secrets. The important thing is to spread uh, because that's going to be good for the industry. And in an interconnected industry, uh, it's going to be good in terms of teaming with trucks. It's going to be uh, good for customers, uh, new opportunities. Um, and you know it in your industry uh and where you come from and the number of things you're involved in and, and michael are involved in you know that that sharing and collegiality and the creation and the power and the value added and uh is so enormous and the railroads have never had that never just the opposite they were uh unto themselves and i think that's going to be the big change the big culture change you know, we've had various initiatives, and, and this goes back to my time mainly at Union Pacific, and at the time Conrail was still in existence, and we we had a project uh, between the, both of our railroads called the Seamless Service Project, and it's it's kind of what we're talking about here, and, and certain CEOs at various uh, cycles in their uh, quarterly earnings statement talked about the only way we're going to get seamless service is with a transcontinental merger. And the, the likelihood of, of transcon mergers goes up or down based on the political cycles and probably is not in the offing. So, again, to Gil's point, it really comes back down to how you basically eliminate the Mississippi River is this DMZ of uh, class one railroading, which basically is what it is. And, you know, to, to a couple of CEOs point, I'll say Jim Foote is one, is realizing that. Uh, he only controls a subset of his business. He doesn't originate a, a big part of it. He doesn't terminate a big part of it. Uh, it all relies on partners, as Gil mentioned. So, you know, how we how we become a solutions provider in terms of uh, better prediction. And there's still run-through trains. I mean, there's still things that have gone on, but there hasn't been a real step function improvement from a seamless perspective in decades. In fact, it's possible it's gone backwards. Well, I think that uh, we're heading in a really encouraging direction and technology is going to unlock all kinds of collaboration and and shared value that um, I get really excited about. I know Mike and I work on this a lot. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm really glad to hear the perspective from you, Gil and Dave, that, that we're headed in a good direction and you're excited about um, railroading. So 
I loved having you on the show. Thank you so much. I hope we can uh, we can do it again very soon. And Mike, thanks thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Josh. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Planes, Trains, and Tanks. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review. To learn more about Shift 5 and our products, visit our website at shift5.io or follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.